Thank you. Um, so the title, um, I wanted to imply that I had like all kinds of uh, culture behind me. I really don't. But um, uh, Waiting for Gadot, I used to, there's variance in how to pronounce that, uh, but um, is, uh, uh, I thought appropriate because when it comes to cancer prevention, kind of the issue before us is, uh, are we going to be effective? Is it an area worthy of study? And and um, it, whether it's an area worthy of study, and I obviously am biased, but think it is something that's worthy of study, and I'll go through a little bit of that with you today. Uh, disclosures related to it. Um, I jokingly shouldn't joke about these things, especially stuff that's in the, the news frequently, but since as uh, Laurel and Dave and others know, I would be co-opted by a free can of Mountain Dew. I'm going to list all the things here, including things that I actually don't receive funding for, but I'm on the uh, boards. Someday I might actually get paid for it, but for the moment not. So the agenda of what we're going to talk about uh, is again cancer prevention agents and a little bit of what goes on with the consortia as you heard about and uh, talk a little bit more about uh, prevention things specific to gynecologic cancers as well since it's an area of great interest to many of us. So why would we consider preventing? Um, you know, you could either look at Google or you could go back to Ben Franklin. Um, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure, and there's still validity to that all these hundreds of years later. So the aspect of why we look at it and why we contemplate trying to prevent cancer development, besides some of the basic principles behind it, are really listed here, which is that the idea that in cancer development, the idea of invasive neoplasia, is a linear process that has multiple opportunities for us to intervene in it. Clearly, from a societal standpoint, the most effective and best ways to intervene are frequently trying to limit behavioral causes of cancer or exposures or other things where lifestyle change uh, is clearly the uh, easiest, most economical, and probably best from a population standpoint. But that's easier said than done, as we all know. So, again, we look at it as an opportunity to try and lower the burden that cancer puts on our society, uh, and I mean that worldwide, not just in our local community. So if we graph it out kind of figuratively here, this is a model that just basically lists out and shows the concept of initiation of normal epithelial cells, as the case here in this diagram, all the way to cancer. And again, the point I want to make with this is remember that malignancy is based on invasion, which is the little bit of uh, the um, aspect here, again, this idea of invasion. So you have dysplasia in various forms of it, carcinoma in situ, meaning it has all the nuclear atypia and other aspects, but just not the invasion that we can find. But this whole process, again, the majority of the data strongly implies that it's a many year process, even for the most aggressive of malignancies. So what I wanted to start with is to just give you a rundown of what are the currently approved FDA agents that are either approved specifically for it or are used in the concept of limiting the risk or preventing cancer. And as I go through these, I'll maybe summarize them at the end, but so tamoxifen or raloxifene, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators related to breast cancer incidents, celecoxib, a selective COX-2 inhibitor, BCG and valrubicin are again for superficial bladder cancer or non-invasive or non-muscle invasive <coughs> bladder neoplasia. Again, the HPV vaccines that hopefully you all know well, and I just highlighted the recent change in the last year of expanding the, the nine valent vaccines from uh, 15 or 26 year olds all the way up to 45 year olds related to that. And then a series of other agents here, which are mainly built around uh, actinic keratosis, or if you will, in preneoplastic skin cancer, um, and some issues related to Barrett's esophagus or severe dysplasia of the esophagus. And these are agents that vary from porphyrin compounds that highlight and lead to greater laser, specific laser wavelength uh, uh, 
basically vaporization of epithelium, to 5-FU given topically, to uh, immunotherapy related agents given topically, to natural project products that all have an effect when given topically. So to summarize where we are and where we've been and how we got here, is as listed here, all, the vast majority of the agents that I just went through with you um, weren't necessarily things that were found in a systematic way of learning from carcinogenesis and then trying to block carcinogenesis. Most of these agents were used and developed in the name of treating a, condi a condition, whether it's actinic keratosis, ferrets esophagus, um, or found somewhat by accident in the case of breast cancer prevention, which is the, the genesis of that was when we gave hormonal agents adjuvantly, when people then looked at the development of contralateral breast cancers, de novo contralateral breast cancers, they found that the rate was significantly lower and those women randomized to these agents, which then led to large prevention-driven studies. And HPV, vaccination, obviously with the genesis of trying to prevent an oncogenic infection. So that's what's gone on and been successful. We have a long track record of lack of success too when it comes to cancer prevention agent development. And much of that has to do with the fact that we tended to jump ahead. There were large studies that some of you might have heard about over the last decade or so that were based on epidemiologic data and went towards prostate cancer prevention studies, some other breast cancer prevention studies and other things. And at least in hindsight, one of the reasons why we think many of those failed, because most of them didn't just fail, some of them were downright uh, deleterious with their results, uh, was that they were based on, again, epidemiology only. There wasn't a kind of a systematic biological description. So one of the things that we're trying to do going forward, and that some of you are participating in, is as listed here, kind of the premise, not unlike what we do in cancer therapy drug development, whether in ovarian cancer or cervical cancer or endometrial cancer, it's usually based on some evidence to suggest the biology of the disease, a way to interrupt it is with particular agents or particular targets, and then you test that and ultimately hopefully prove that there is a clinical benefit. So we are trying to do that in prevention as well. And it's listed here with the goals of finding tolerable and clinically viable agents that could lead to uh, preventing the risk or the burden of cancer for any number of us. And as the, the various issues that I have listed out here. So one of the key things uh, as, as we think about it, and uh, those of us that are doing this work uh, in the, the gynecologic cancer group is when we think of therapy development uh, in cancer, there's a pretty strong and obvious what we call surrogate marker. And that is when somebody's tumor from whatever malignancy, when it decreases or shrinks in size or uh, CA125 protein value goes down, that's a reasonably strong surrogate that you're having a positive biological effect. It doesn't guarantee success, it doesn't mean that it's profoundly of value, but it certainly gives you a sense of a biological signal. Um, and that's one of the key differences between therapy development in cancer and prevention. Similar vascular disease, why do we check people's blood pressure? Why do we check our lipid levels? Because they are quantitative, non-invasive surrogate markers of other disease, whether that's kidney disease, hypertension, with vascular disease, whether it's heart disease. And the real strength of that is the fact that, as I said earlier, they're non-invasive, they're quantitative, and they're, not, they're both prognostic and predictive. So in prevention, we are trying to discover or at least look at aspects of that. So similar vascular health, we are trying to come up with a surrogate marker. And the quick jump ahead is we do not have a surrogate. Uh, and I'll describe a little bit of this later. But so we are looking for and trying to find something that is a quicker, easier way to tell us whether it's an uh, endometrial cancer or ovarian cancer risk or breast cancer or what have you, 
that by changing or perturbing that marker, we are likely to have a beneficial effect. So the things we look at are intraepithelial neoplasia, which we'll describe a little bit more, tissue biomarkers of various kinds, genetic or genomic, cellular or extracellular markers, and I'll give you again a list of some of those. But ultimately, again, with any surrogate marker is, um, is it really effective? Is it predictive and prognostic? What are the vagaries of the test, like variability or sensitivity? And I'll try and talk a little bit about that as we go on. So intraepithelial plasia, CIN as an example, or at some level you could almost call complex atypical hyperplasia in this same kind of general region. So why it might be of value is that intraepithelial plasia compared to invasive disease shares much of the same phenotypic and genotypic changes. And there's a lot going on um, with what's called the pre-genome or pre-cancer genome atlas. And essentially what that shows, and I'll come in a little bit later, is that across most of the malignancies, most of the invasive diseases and cancer, that the most common genetic changes, or genomic changes, if you will, actually occur in the early setting of non-invasive disease, whether it's RAS, or whether it's P10, endometrial cancer, or things like that, that we can find those things frequently early in the intraepithelial neoplasia aspect of the tissue. So it isn't a late event, it tends to be an early event. Um, IEN is already considered a disease, as I showed you that list of things that are approved, that when it comes to actinic keratosis or Barrett's esophagus with severe dysplasia, or even DCIS in breast cancer, or CIN in cervical disease, we are clearly treating it as a problem. Um, so again, we look at it. The negatives with IEN are as listed here, variability. The fact that, as many of you all know, not all dysplasia progresses to invasive disease. Um, so one of the struggles that we've had in some aspects of cancer prevention are, and prostate cancer was a good example of this, when we're eradicating dysplasia, or when we're eradicating IEM with a systemic agent or a vaccine approach, are we just getting rid of the lesions that were going to go away on their own, or are we getting rid of the lesions that were destined to become invasive disease? So that's something that we struggle with uh, a little bit. So this is a listing of some of the things in our studies, and I'll show a few examples here coming up that we look at when it comes to intraepithelial neoplasia. All these things are aspects of prevention studies that we or our colleagues around the country look at and we try and intervene in. Um, and there's a simple fact of partly why we do that, because we don't have a, if you will, a blood-borne or some other or an imaging surrogate. We go to the tissue. We're trying to determine are we having an effect at the target tissue. So, and there's no um, coincidence that much of where we studied and know the most about carcinogenesis were areas or malignancies where we had access to the tissue, skin, cervix, uh, the GI tract. And we're learning that there are similar things in areas we didn't have as easy access to in the past, the bronchial epithelium or other areas of our body with malignancy that some of the things that you've all learned over the years in cervical neoplasia are true in other things too, even with cervical neoplasia principally being caused by oncogenic infections. But So that's IEN we look at and follow along. So other biomarkers that we are studying and look at, including in some of our gynecologic prevention studies, are as listed here. Again, and some of this you could easily say it looks like you're kind of uh, reaching for anything, and that would be true. We are looking and testing anything that we can to try and come up with what is a surrogate marker that could achieve or make cancer prevention agent development more efficient. So we can look at genetic genomic markers in R. We can look at nonspecific. There's a lot of studies that look just at proliferation, KI67 or PCNA, or cyclone D1, or at apoptosis. Most of the natural preventative agents and others show an ability to enhance or increase apoptosis. 
which malignancies frequently have a diminished apoptotic pathway, or very specific or targeted biomarkers as listed here. All these are things that we've looked at for the various reasons. So how the NCI wanted to try and make this more systematic uh, uh, is the following. So I, essentially approximately 15 years ago, they decided that they would encourage us as institutions to kind of bind together and build consortia to do prevention studies, or early phase prevention studies, in the name of, again, trying to develop agents that followed a systematic development path. So we were fortunate uh, enough 15 years ago to be one of six uh, lead sites for consortia to do these types of studies, and the others as, as listed here. And, and back at that time, our consortium was uh, inclusive of the following sites. And to be honest, a lot of what we did was uh, bladder and prostate or skin uh, interested because that's where we had done a lot of work. And I'll show you how we kind of evolved or changed with some of our target areas. But these are the various sites that participated back then. And these are the studies that we did. Genistein, which was a soy isoflavone, diindylmethane, which again is kind of one of the main uh, constituents of uh, cruciferous vegetables. Polyphenon E is a formulation of green tea. Um, UAV I'll show you later. Acolbophene was a different version of a selective estrogen receptor modulator. Hyoglitazone is an anti or a diabetes treatment, what's called a P-Pargamma agonist that we're still looking at because of the role of that pathway in carcinogenesis. Vitamin D, self-explanatory, genesis I mentioned, and the uh, pomegranate, uh, again, you see the palm, wonderful commercials on TV. Um, so those are some things we looked at, and that was really kind of a sign of what was available to us, principally natural products. Um, again, based on what was available, what were people studying at the time, so that's where most of the studies were. So this uh, consortium was recompeted then approximately uh, six to seven years ago, and the five uh, consortia were selected, and again, we were fortunate enough to be one of those five. And our group uh, evolved a little bit, but had some of the same players and some additions along the way that would do the prevention studies with us. And again, some of the same examples from before, but some new examples of where we were trying to go with looking at preventative agents. Erlotinib is an EGFR agonist, antagonist, excuse me, small molecule inhibitor that's been used across colon cancer, lung cancer, etc. cetera. Uh, that's a study recently, just recently did in bladder cancer. Pomegranate, I mentioned before. UAB, I'll show again here uh, in just a little bit. Examestane, an aromatase inhibitor what that we're doing right now in endometrial uh, carcinogenesis. And then vaccines, uh, both DNA epitope vaccines and a potential new HPV vaccine. And uh, also looking at kind of topical approaches in cervical cancer. The studies in red are either about to start or haven't started yet. And I'll show some examples of that here in a bit. So we recently are recompeting this consortia. We're still waiting to kind of hear on that. Our consortium, if refunded, would uh, include the following. And uh, not just because I'm speaking to uh, this audience today, but we've made a kind of concerted effort to try and get more and more into gynecologic prevention uh, and have recruited people specific for that, the University of Oklahoma, Staten Island University Hospital, and I'll give some other examples of that because of our growing kind of interest, growing expertise, growing work done here by Lisa Manish and others um, on looking at gynecologic cancer prevention. And I'll give again some examples of that. So our group as a whole, these are kind of the areas we've tended to look at. In red, again, are pertinent to our discussion today that we are looking forward to potentially doing multiple more studies that are geared towards endometrial, cervical, or ovarian uh, cancer prevention. So to give kind of examples of what we do and why we do it, um, so we are what we again describe as we do the early phase prevention studies. And, and ultimately the purpose of that, not unlike in therapy, not unlike in if you're studying a new hypertensive drug or a new antibiotic, 
is these early phase studies are really to look at issues of safety and, if you will, clinical viability, meaning does it potentially achieve what we intended to, in our case, prevent or decrease the incidence of cancer? And is it something that can be used and is clinically viable because it's tolerable or people are willing to take it? And that's an issue, as you would imagine, for much of what we look at and do. So our phase one studies vary from first in human studies that I'll describe to uh, repurposing of agents. Um, and, and I'll give kind of two examples here of first in human studies that we're doing. Um, that one that kind of all a bit history, and that is what are called rexinoids or vitamin A derivatives. And the other is kind of our new reality of the importance of immunology in cancer, and that is vaccine approaches to preventing, in this case, breast cancer. So the first thing that I'll describe, and again, is a combination work with the University of Alabama, Birmingham, is an agent that they developed. So for years, actually for decades, really, retinoids and rexinoids, or vitamin A derivatives, uh, as potent antiproliferatives, have been looked at from a cancer prevention and, in fact, a cancer therapy standpoint. Uh, retinoids are used extensively in certain types of leukemia, and there was early work going back 30 to 40 years that they had preventative properties. The catch with retinoids or rexinoids are the fact that they have a multitude of effects, as any number of hormone receptors, transcription factor receptors do. And vitamin A derivatives have a, are a class of agents and have RAR receptors, retinoic acid receptors or RXR receptors, and they have varying effects. Rexinoids preferentially bind to the RXR receptor. All of these uh, nuclear-based hormones, what they do, I mean, excuse me, nuclear-based receptors, um, they have their effects on DNA transcription related to how they dimerize, usually homodimerization, but also heterodimerization, to RXR receptors or an RXR and a thyroid receptor, RXR, or a liver X receptor. And as potent and as valuable as rexinoids and retinoids have been, they come with a great deal of toxicity. And one of those toxicities is hypertriglyceridemia. And work done by UAB showed that part of the problem with rexinoids was that the RXR receptor, when the ligand, in this case, the rexinoid would bind to it, that it frequently heterodimerized with what's called the liver X receptor. And that led to changes within the liver and changes in triglyceride metabolism. So they basically synthesized the 9-cis-retinoic acid analog that they showed quite nicely that it preferentially homodimerized rather than heterodimerized. So there was much less liver X receptor binding. And part of that had to do with the fact that it's, it's uh, what's called tetralone ring, which is in the lower right, versus a beta ionine ring, which is in, if you go to the very upper left part of the diagram, uh, which is the hallmark of retinoids and rexinoids. But that led to, again, different binding. So we are doing and have done and completed a first in human study of it. And we did it a little bit differently than what we do on the therapy side. And as shown in this diagram, what we would do is, again, we looked at various escalations of this. And we did a first dose followed by a washout of seven days. And then we did continuous dosing for the next uh, four weeks after that, what is shown in this diagram. And again, What's interesting with this compound is if you look at 9 cis retinoic acid, which it was developed from in, in an analog of, you can probably give about 10 milligrams a day to at most 20 milligrams a day of 9 cis retinoic acid before you get into hypertriglyceridemia, nausea, headache, skin changes. And this agent, we've actually dosed all the way up to 240 milligrams. And that is either a really good thing or a real bad thing. And what I mean by that is, it either is incredibly selective, and that's what we're obviously hoping, or to be honest, it isn't binding at all. And when you start giving that much of a dose and you see little to no toxicity, one of the worries you have is, is it really binding? Is there species differentiation? In animal studies, they can show the binding and some of the toxicities, but we haven't shown it in people. So it's either really good or just the opposite of that. But if we look at pharmacokinetics, it's one of the goals of it. If you go from left to right, uh, and really maybe just look at the top part of the C-max, or the peak levels, 
you, so you see linearity up to 160, but we saw kind of a plateau from 160 to 240. And there's different theories about that, and the same with the AUC. And that changes how we might look at it with other studies. Again, if you look at the grading of adverse events, again, and these are placebo-controlled studies, so we can compare these across groups and to people taking placebo in a double-blinded way. That way, if you look from zero placebo all the way to 240, what you'll see is more events grade two and grade three. And uh, so that would be concerning. And in fact, most of those events were related to hypertension. But it gets into kind of the, if you will, vagaries of clinical research that many of you know. There can be more to the picture than that. So we looked at blood pressure specifically, and it's always good to throw up one really simple figure here for you to kind of look through. Um, but essentially what this Gamish shows, and the real dark line is placebo, is that there really is no evidence that we're raising blood pressure. It kind of gets into how you take the blood pressure, when you take it, how you grade it, and all of you doing the clinical research studies know that, again, it gets into some of the issues that you always have to be very diligent to in your clinical research studies. So quantitatively, we show no evidence of affecting blood pressure. And the same is with triglyceride levels. The placebo group is the very dark line, as you can see, again, a lot of variability over time. But if you follow the means and, and some of the curves, essentially what you see is from day one through uh, day 35. I mean, the last part of the curve and figure here, where maybe there's a bit of incline, is actually when everybody went off drug. That's the final washout. But again, no quantitative evidence of affecting triglyceride levels. So again, if we summarize this agent, uh, again, we certainly showed it to have little to no toxicity. Uh, people were certainly willing to take it. Compliance wasn't an issue. The pharmacokinetics were linear, at least up to 160, not after that. So where we're going with it now is, uh, is obviously taking it into more specific studies, trying to determine a biological effect, in this case in breast, skin, and other potential areas, because retinoids and rexinoids, their antiproliferative effect really is not unique to any one particular neoplastic tissue site. It's had strong uh, antiproliferative effects really in almost every malignancy type ever tested. Again, the current, if you will, the future of now is immunotherapy, or in our case, immunoprevention. So this is just an example of an ongoing study, a first in human study that we're doing in concert with the University of Washington. And this is giving a DNA-based vaccine. So taking, if you will, uh, the, the sequences related to HER2, IGF, our insulin-like growth factor binding protein 2 and insulin-like growth factor 1 receptor and basically giving that in a way to stimulate an immune reaction to it. And why are we doing that? Because again, as I mentioned earlier when it comes to the pre-cancer genome atlas, if you look at dysplastic tissue, um, again, the same upregulated genes or mutated genes that we see in malignancy, we see in the early dysplasia. So in breast DCIS or LCIS or atypical ductal hypoplasia, you frequently find overexpression of HER2 or increased expression of IGF-1 receptor. Um, so this is a DNA epitope vaccine developed by Norodesis at the University of Washington that in animal studies showed a great deal of immunogenicity and an ability to stop the progression of dysplasia in animal models. So right now, just us and the University of Washington are doing a gradual dose escalation study of this DNA vaccine against breast cancer. Now the FDA wanted us to only offer this to begin with in women who've recently undergone and completed treatment for breast cancer. So if you will, women with uh, stage two breast cancer that are now in remission. Um, that's clearly not ultimately the target population, but that's where the FDA wanted us to start. And the issue with a vaccine, and unlike as I get into some of the HPV vaccine work that we're looking at, is you know, what do we look at as the endpoints for this study? I mean, again, the struggle that we have in cancer prevention development is the ultimate primary endpoint is preventing cancer. Um, again, those are studies that take years to do and uh, large amounts of money. 
So again, it's how do we determine potential? Well, at least for these vaccine studies and uh, DNA-based vaccine studies, really mainly looking at an immune reaction, immune reactivity. And in red at the bottom of the slide, I list out some of the things that we're looking at and following. Now again, that doesn't mean we know that these are truly good surrogate markers of what we're looking for. But again, we're starting wherever we can related to looking for some sort of biological effect. So that's a study that will likely be done here probably in the next few months. So phase two studies like therapy phase two studies are more tissue or disease specific. They occur in any number of ways as listed here. And I'll give kind of again quick two, ex uh, two quick examples of what we're doing in our consortium. Genistein, uh, again, soy isoflavone, and in the lower left of the slide is the diagram. Even though genistein probably has more press related to soy isoflavones as phytoestrogens, which just means it looks like estradiol, uh, we actually were studying it because there was data that it, it blocked or inhibited EGFR phosphorylase or epidermal growth factor receptor, which is a growth factor in neoplastic progression. And on the right of the slide, it gives you kind of a, the schema of the study. And the point I make here is that much of what we do, whether it's in gynecologic prevention or breast prevention or GI or bladder, as the case with this study, is building our studies around an opportunity to get tissue. So we frequently do a lot of what are called window of opportunity studies or pre-surgery studies. Uh, and why do we do that? Because it's access to the tissue, where we're not adding risk um, to above and beyond the risk that somebody was going to have for standard of care. So in this study, it's men and women with suspected bladder cancer. And they're going to get either surgery or a transurethral resection of that tumor. And when we know they're going to have that done, we ask them to volunteer for a study. In this case, a study where they either got genistein to varying doses or placebo. And if you are thinking, that must be hard to convince people to go into that study, you are right. These studies are very hard to accrue to. We've done both surveys and our own work. And whether it's in gyan cancer, uh, as the, the group here is already strongly working on in a study I'll show here shortly, or in breast or anything, if we get about 10% of eligible people to agree to the study, we're actually doing pretty well. Um, because again, the people that agree to do this are doing it strictly for altruism. There is no direct benefit to that. So we try and build these things in and try and be as conscious of that as we can uh, in trying to learn in advance the idea of prevention for society. So that's the schema of this study. And I just wanted to show this study because it had both positive and negative results. And it gets into even a little bit of some of the variability or issues we struggle with. So when we gave this study, in fact, we indeed showed that phosphorylation of EGFR was significantly reduced in the people who got genistein as compared to the people who got placebo. And if you look at the figure and the pictures, so in the, the figure of the upper left, that is normal epithelium getting placebo, and the dark staining or brown staining is e phosphorylated EGFR. And if you go to immediate right, that is tumor tissue with placebo, again with even more brown staining or phosphorylation of EGFR across the epithelial cells. Then if you go to the bottom left, that is normal bladder urethelium getting, getting genistein. And then if you go to the right, it is tumor epithelial tissue getting genistein. And what a lot of natural products have shown, and it's why there's always been so much interest in them, is they seem to have differential effects across normal and neoplastic tissue. And that, whether it's apoptosis or EGFR, that usually we don't see that much effect on the normal tissue, but we see it on the neoplastic tissue. So in that respect, the primary endpoint was, was proven. And that we showed what we think is a biological effect. Now the modest negative is we looked at a lot of other markers too and didn't see a hint of anything there. So it raises the question of where and what we should do with that. But it was well tolerated and we saw a biological effect. A study that's ongoing right now 
uh, that Lisa's leading here, and it's done uh, with Britt Erickson out of Minnesota, along with UAB, and uh, and also uh, partly because I think the inside people like going to Italy to honor them. We just added an Italian center to our site. Actually, our staff are looking forward to going to Italy to audit them as well. But So this is a, a XMS stain, so the rotase inhibitor, in women about to undergo hysterectomy related to uh, whether atypical ductal hyperplasia or uh, intraepithelial hyperplasia or just early stage, low grade, or grade one adenocea. And again, like I've mentioned before, we build it around some standard of care case. In this case, the women are standardly being recommended to have a hysterectomy. So we ask them to participate in the study and with the endpoints as listed there. And there's a lot of interesting uh, things that are being added to this study, trying to use as an example, using tampon recovery of DNA. And the reason being that would be a relatively non-invasive way to get epithelial DNA or you know, dysplastic cell DNA to, to examine it both in a non-invasive way and to look at it from an intervention standpoint. And also try to get better look at proteins, etc. So we're constantly trying to find better ways to really gauge or judge, are we making an impact? Do we have a biological signal that's of value? And preferably, we'd like to do that in a non-invasive way. So where are we going with the, the consortium? McKinn is listed here, vaccines. We have a, an interest, and I have an interest, and we all do in doing even more in cervical, ovarian, and endometrial prevention. And those are just, again, some of the issues that we look at, and if time allows, I'll mention some of the things that some of our other colleagues around the country are interested in doing with us. But vaccines, again, uh, immunology, immunoprevention, immunotherapy, and malignancy is not going away. In fact, there's going to be more of it, as there should be, as we understand immunology better and learn how to use it, learn how to manipulate it. There's going to be more of that. So the same group out of Washington that we're doing what's called the WALKVAC or the triple epitope DNA vaccine for breast cancer. She's also developing similar ones for ovarian cancer and colon cancer. Uh, STEMVAC is just, again, looking at dendritic cells or early cells and geared more towards ER, PR, triple negative breast cancer development and looking at some of the aspects of that. Here in uh, Wisconsin, Doug McNeil has a DNA-based vaccine for prostate cancer that we have interest in it for preventative. And I'll describe next, we are hoping to do a novel HPV vaccine. Uh, and this is a vaccine that originates uh, in its work from uh, a researcher at uh, Hopkins by the name of Richard Roden, along with a colleague at the University of Vienna, Dr. Kirnbauer. And what it is, is it's more of an L2-based HPV vaccine. So just to remind all of you, the current approved HPV vaccines are principally built upon L1, or late 1 protein, or the main capsid, external capsid. And why are they based on that? Because the L1 protein is the most or one of the most immunogenetic or Im immunogenicity parts of HPV. Now the issue with L1 DNA and L1 protein production is it is very genotype specific and the immunogenicity is as well. Whereas L2, and again remember there's late 1, late 2 protein, early 6, early 7 proteins, E6, E7, which is the main oncogenic driver of HPV in the epithelial cells. But L2 is highly conserved across all the genotypes. But the reason why it wasn't done initially is it's not as immunogenetic as uh, L1 is. But L2 still does have its own immunogenicity. So we are looking forward to doing uh, a first in human HPV vaccine that's more geared towards potentially being pan-immunoreactive. And in the animal studies, it essentially induced immunity to all HPV genotypes. Um, and it's done as listed here. And that's a study we're waiting to do, because we're waiting on basically protein and product to, to move that forward. But it's something that we're looking forward to. Again, as work that maybe you've heard related to Lisa Manish, 
that, again, looking at ovarian cancer prevention is listed here, and I, I'll let them explain it much better than I, but we're interested in trying to expand this and looking at it based on the data, based on as we learn more about high-grade serous carcinomas, um, about their etiology is listed here. And with our uh, work with the University of Oklahoma, uh, and they have some ongoing interest in this area, just like Lisa Manish do as well, of exploring agents in this much more. And so we're looking forward to the possibilities with that. In cervical cancer, we have things ongoing right now. Because of kind of a long-standing interest in green tea polyphenols and the effects they have, we actually have an ongoing study, and I'll give you some of the data, but we are about to start at actually a study in Korea because they were interested in doing it and had a great deal of interest in topical green tea, or Verigen, as some of you know, which is approved for the treatment of venereal warts. Um, so we are interested in looking at it for oncogenic infections, not just non-oncogenic infections. Also working with uh, researchers, Betty Steinberg and Mario Castellano at Staten Island, who have a topical formulation they've developed, which is principally natural product based, but has really wonderful potency in much of the modeling they've done at treating cervical dysplasia. Uh, again, these are all topical approaches, which there's a bunch of issues with that, compliance, viability, things like that. But trying to come up with interventions that are hopefully minimally to non-toxic um, that are effective as well. But just with some of the agents here. And this just describes some early work done out of the Paul Lambert lab here with topical green tea or Verigen. If you go across at the lower, at the right are figures which basically just show cell viability or growth inhibition of HPV-16 transformed epithelial cell lines and how green tea applied or green tea exposure strongly, very strongly, over 24, 48, 72 hours, block that proliferation. If you go to the left with the, the pictures, essentially control corn oil and verigen treatment, and this is an organotypic raft formation of HPV-16 transformed cells, which grow and model, again, dysplasia and ultimately invasion. And what it shows is that when you give uh, verigen on the far right, you get more of a stratified epithelium rather than a hyperproliferative epithelium as you see on the left or middle. And then the bottom slides are just looking at DNA synthesis and when you see the pink um, or chartreuse, if that's a, the right color, um, what that shows is you have an ongoing DNA synthesis and it models the above. And essentially at the right with Verigen you see how it shuts down DNA synthesis leading to that. So another big thing we're interested in is just the fact that we struggle not just with surrogates, but we struggle with when we look at biomarkers that there's a great deal of variability, where you do the biopsy, where you get the tissue matters. Uh, and this is just a diagram to show, in this case, in prostate cancer. Uh, and it makes sense when you think of field effects. If four is the actual malignancy, the closer you are to the malignancy, the more that surrounding normal epithelium mimics the malignancy, and the further you get away, the less it mimics it, related to whether it's proliferation, in this case KI-67, or other potential markers of proliferation or apoptosis. Again, looking for new biomarkers. This is with colleagues at Hopkins, and it's looking at methylation status. Again, across most malignancies, most dysplasia and tissue, you can correlate dysplasia, dysplasia all the way to invasive disease with the accumulation of, again, genetic or genomic changes, in this case, methylation changes. And they are trying to come up with kind of through non-invasive ways, in this case, random fine needle aspirations of the breast, of getting um, tissue, uh, excuse me, getting um, quantitation of the methylation that occurs. What I was thinking about is, if I was the one getting poked in the breast with a needle, I'd probably call that invasive, so I should refer to it as invasive uh, biomarker work. Uh, but, so, quantitative methylation status is something where, again, we're trying to come up with biomarkers that are predictive, prognostic, and even better yet, quantitative. Because, again, we can use them that way. <clears throat> Another area we're looking at studying is, again, metabolic status, body mass index, how that affects cancer risk. We know that, whether that's endometrial cancer or breast cancer. And this is a study out of researchers at Penn State that are in our group. 
with showing that when it comes to omega-3 fatty acids and DHA related to that, that there seems to be a preferential effect in, uh, if you will, the metabolic state of obese uh, patients as compared to non-obese. And they showed in some studies that when it came to combining omega-3 fatty acids, in this case DHA, with raloxifene, that where they found a significant change in mammographic density was only in the women of a certain size, implying of a certain cellular and metabolic status. And again, should and could we look at how we risk, stratify, or intervene based on some of these factors? And again, I've mentioned numerous things related to uh, nutrients or natural products. Again, there's still interest in that. As I've shown, we're studying other things as well. But one of the things that comes to mind when it comes to the environment around us, especially what we eat and how we live our lives, is that germline variants in metabolism probably are important related to how we respond or don't respond to certain things from our environment. And that's certainly true of nutrients. Nutrients and the things we look at, whether it's green tea, genistein, uh, or in, in this case, uh, pomegranate, grape, uh, grape seed extract, they are highly, highly metabolized. In fact, most of uh, their bioavailability is limited by almost rapid metabolism. So it makes sense at some level that germline changes in how we metabolize these agents could have an effect and have a role in their value to us or lack of value. And this is a study mainly looking at prostate cancer, which showed that a certain uh, magnesium SOD2 or MN SOD2 metabolizing enzyme um, that basically SNPs or variants to it greatly influenced how we responded to agents with that. So there's ongoing work that we're looking at again related to stratifying people related to how our germline metabolism enzymes relate to the environment and the things we're exposed to. So, you know, back to my beginning here, are we waiting for a ghetto um, with cancer prevention agent development? I'd like to think not. Um, uh, what is true is that if we go back 50 years, cancer, or excuse me, heart disease or vascular prevention wasn't really taking off. And the reason it eventually took off, as a lot of the cardiology prevention people would tell me, is that it stopped being prevention and started being therapy of the surrogate marker, therapy of lipids, therapy of blood pressure, etc. So I think that uh, cancer prevention agent development will continue to grow and develop. I think as we get a better understanding of risk, a better understanding of just carcinogenesis and the different aspects of it, um, that will help. Currently, industry really has nothing to do with cancer prevention agent development. Why is that? Because they view it as far too risky. Uh, those of you who've been around as long as I might remember an agent by the name of Rofacoxib, which was to help with arthritis pain as a selective COX-2 inhibitor. Well, that agent is no longer on the market, and the reason it isn't on the market is because prevention studies showed that it was not safe. Because we do long-term placebo-controlled safety studies that a lot of other areas don't, so industry has been very reluctant to kind of team up with us until, again, we show a more efficient way of development. And the reason I have fear in red is that all of us know, and I, I think it's unfortunate, but also understandable, that society fears cancer almost more than anything else. Uh, Fifty years ago, uh, I remember a time when we all feared heart disease because people could just drop over at any moment. And we should still feel, excuse me, we should still fear vascular disease because it's still incredibly uh, destructive and important. But I think what's happened is that cancer now is viewed as somewhat fatalistic by people. I'm either going to get it or I'm not. So as a result, they worry that no matter what they do, they're going to get it. So I think as we develop better, safer, more effective preventative strategies, whether it's in cervical, like we're doing with HPV vaccination, or endometrial, or breast, or ovarian, I think there will be kind of a public desire for it, which then means industry will be very interested. But clearly, we have to get better, and the research that we do, we have to get more efficient with how we do it. So, again, a lot of people involved in all these studies and the consortium. Um, I especially want to thank Lisa Berlif, who's been uh, really a champion of the ongoing uh, 
um, uh, prevention studies that we're doing now and that we hope to continue doing. Um, so with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you. We do have to stop because we're over, Ellen. I'm sorry. So applause and Dinesh has been 